lovely crowd to gather in the gallery on a Saturday afternoon to celebrate International Women's Day. Thank you so much for coming along and joining us um, for this very special event. I would like to begin this afternoon's event by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the lands of the Terrible and Thunder, Garang Garang, Gurang and Bayili peoples. I would like to acknowledge the thousands of generations of culture that have shaped this land. And particularly with International Women's Day, I'd like to acknowledge the role of women in that culture and what they have contributed to the lands on which we live and work. I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past and present, and acknowledge any First Nations people joining us here today. For those of you I haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Rebecca McDuff and I'm the Gallery Director for Wonderberg Regional Galleries. And of course, I don't think my guest of honour today needs a lot of introduction, but I am joined today um, as a very special guest with, by Linda Jackson, who um, I'm absolutely thrilled and a little bit fangirly to be sitting up here with Linda chatting chat of today. So, thank you, Linda. Okay, so um, we're going to sort of dive straight into it today with our questions because we have got quite a fun afternoon planned for you. Please eat and drink and be merry while we talk. We will not be offended because um, we also understand Linda's plate got put in front of and then I whisked her up here. So um, we, <laughs> we definitely understand that you need to enjoy while you're listening to us. Um, and yes, so we're just going to dive straight in. We will have some time for questions at the end. If you have a really burning question, of course, through the talk, please feel free to ask that. Um, yes, but if not, we will take some questions from the floor at the end of today. So thank you. Okay, I'm actually going to start with um, a year. We're going to start with 1975, International Year of Women. Very significant year worldwide. In Australia, very significant year. Um, we were under the Whitlam government. They committed 3.3 million, which in those days was a lot of money, to um, to women's projects and women's issues over a two-year period. We had the first um, uh, con international convention on women's issues. We had changes made to the Family Law Act in that year that gave women more rights. We also um, saw the um, uh, sorry, I've got my, my my brain went there for a minute. The first Women in Politics Conference also was held in Canberra. So really significant year was 1975. And there was a lot happening in your life at the time as well, Linda. <laughs> so I'm going to tell us about 1975 in Linda Jackson land. It was fun. <laughs> Because I met Jenny Key in 1973 and she was just opening her shop in the Strand Arcade and then we did our first fashion show that was mostly vintage 50s fabrics and things like that that I discovered in Melbourne as I grew up in Melbourne, Beachside, Go Morris and we did our first show in the Hingara Chinese restaurant where we went every Friday to have that was our routine. Jenny would pick up the frocks on the Friday morning, we'd go into Chinatown, go to the Hingara restaurant, have our lunch, and then we'd go and hang out in her shop, Flamingo Park, for the rest of the afternoon. So we asked, of course we did, ask the Chinese restaurant, could we do a fashion show there? And Jenny's dad was quite well known in Chinatown in those early days anyway. And so it was a three-storey building, and on the first floor, on the ground floor was the restaurant. Upstairs was another separate part that was a restaurant that had laminex, pink and green laminex walls. And we all, and then on the third floor up was where the models would get changed. So it was December 1974, and I had all these Chinese opera costumes that I got when I was doing my traveling that I picked up from an incredible woman who was a Chinese opera singer in Malaysia with the Chinese friends and it was so the Chinese opera costumes and all these prints from the 1950s and we did this fantastic show. So then the next year we thought, well, why don't we do something even more fabulous as we wanted to? And it was 1975 at the Bondi Pavilion at Bondi Beach and we did a theatrical event with a hand-painted backdrop that Jenny's husband, Michael Ramsden, had painted. A morning daytime and a nighttime scene of course that's what you, that's what you had to do and with all the fox that hand painted david mcdermott it was the beginning of doing the hand painted i cut out the shapes 
David would hand paint them. That meant that they knew exactly where the artwork would go on the body. And Charlotte Barnes, a friend of Jenny's from London, I would send, she was in Sydney for a while, and then I would post the cut out frocks to her in London, and she would paint them and send them back. That's what you did. <laughs> and then we had this amazing show, and it was pretty awesome, actually. And as a theatrical event, we loved it. And that's 1975. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no, I'll do it. So, um, the collaboration Jenny Key, of course, was um, a, a big part of what people know about you originally in those early 1970s. Obviously, there's been a huge life since then that we will talk about today, but talk to us more about how did that come about? How did the collaboration happen? And what, and, and what it actually meant to be two female artists in the 1970s in Australia, as it was then creating what you did at the time. Yeah, because I travelled, growing up in Melbourne, and then travelled to New Guinea, all through Asia, over to Paris, and for six months actually, which was pretty amazing, and then going to London for a short time. Then, and I went to where Jenny worked, but when you're not meant to meet somebody, you don't meet them. But that was pretty extraordinary because where she worked was a really famous marketplace, but. Then back to Australia, back to Melbourne, and then up to Sydney with an exhibition at the Bernardin Gallery, middle of 1973, and everyone had said, you have to meet Jenny Key, and then she had been told, you've got to meet Linda, she's got these amazing clothes. So we met, and it was one of those stories where you just don't stop talking. You, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to try to explain, because I guess everyone here would have friendships that they've met with people over the years that when you, you just meet and you know there's something about it. And we just, from that day on, had this incredible time together. And she was just about to open her shop, so I got to see it just before in the Strand Arcade. Then I had to go back to Melbourne, send up a few things made for her to put in the shop, and then, then relocate it up to live in Tamarama and Bondi in Sydney. So that started our incredible friendship. But as women together, that's just what we did. We didn't think about what other people thought about anything because what we were doing, firing off each other all the time as a creative way of working, was fantastic. You had very different. You had very different working styles as well that you and I've spoken about a bit. Do you want to elaborate on that a bit? So for me, I could make cuts. So I could do all of that side of things, and it was easy. I started when I asked my mother, why was I recently looking at photographs and I'm darning a sock and I'm two years old? And she said, and I'm left-handed, and she said, you asked me if you could darn a sock? And she said, I showed you. And that just that thing of making things was a part of my life, I guess, because my mother made my clothes. That's how I come I started sewing, because when I started making my own clothes, well, no, Mum was making my clothes and I'd say, well, I want it like this, and I'm a bit older, and I want it like that. And she said, from now on, you are learning to sew, you're getting pocket money, you have to buy your own material, because Mum and Dad had met... Can we say this now? Yeah. <laughs> my father and mother met ballroom dancing, because Dad was a ballroom dancer, instructor, actually, I discovered more recently with some notes that Mum wrote, and he heard that my mother was a very good ballroom dancer, so and she was quite tiny. She wasn't. She was four foot eleven, quite tiny. So and Dad was five foot five, not very tall, perfect. And he asked Mum to join the tango team, and they just then, of course, as Mum said, well, you know, you got then you got married, and then you, they just kept dancing, and then I arrived later, and just all those stories. I lost the track. No, 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 no. So growing up and then with mum and knowing about, you know, she had the gowns for me to dress up in and things like that and just the whole thing of sewing and making your own clothes in those days, that's what everybody did. So I was asking mum to do this and that and she said, look, you're getting pocket money, you have to learn to make your own clothes. And then later on, as I'm making my own clothes, mum said, she told me this only quite a few years ago actually, I had to walk behind you because everyone always wanted to stop and stare at you. So <laughs> I can blame my mother. <laughs> so I think 
And when we were talking there, we were talking about um, that collaboration with Jenny, and um, there's a wonderful quote that I found that Jenny said about you. She said um, that you were the brains of the operation. And she said, Linda is extraordinary. She does everything from beginning to end. My knack is having the idea, then having people execute it for me. But Linda, she can do it all. That's why we thought each other was amazing. Because what? Jenny was so clever because she would have these ideas. And then she could find the most amazing people to create them. Now that is a talent. I couldn't help it because for me, I had to do that myself. So in a way, we were completely opposite. And I think that it's about 50 years we've known each other now. I think that part of that admiring the other person is a really great way to have an incredible friendship because you're not, you're not, you're not competing because you can't. Because I couldn't do what Jenny did and she couldn't do what I did. So therefore, the respect was there, which I think with women and any friends or family is a really great way to start of our collaboration of working together. So it was Jenny's shop and everything I did in those early days all went into her shop. So therefore it had my name and the Flamingo Park label on them, but I always acknowledged that it was Jenny's shop, but we did everything together. I think that collaboration is something that is very, that we see when women work together, that has been, particularly in the arts, it's something that's quite different. Oh, it, it, it's, it's more noted that women are happy to collaborate. And I think that collaboration with you and Jenny, it was interesting. And I think, when, I love when you talk about the shop though, because it's not, you we say it was not exactly like a retail space as we would know it now. Do you want to, it was more one-offs and um, you created, talk, talk to me, the, the way you told me about the shop, I really love, would love you to describe that for everyone. Well, but it was quite original that Jenny did get the shop in the Strand Arcade because it was a few floors in the building and what was up, there were shops downstairs and what was upstairs were all the workrooms, like the milliners, I got all their cupboards, which are incredible, with beautiful big drawers. You know, when they closed down, we were able to get some of their furniture. So, you know, the drawers that the hats were kept in, I had, I ended up with those in my studio, which was amazing. So, to be, to get a shop upstairs in that place was rather incredible in 1973 because it was quite unique and then it became a little meeting place and it was one of those we did a few shows walking around the floors in that you know in that space over over time but it was um it just became a hub of a meeting place which was really important and the original things jenny's it was called flamingo park because it was jenny's husband michael rams and it was his painting of the flamingos that went up on the wall and it was a tiny shop. I was just explaining this to someone recently. It was a really tiny shop. It was probably only the size to that space there, tiny. Whereas people see it as this big place. And then later on, Jenny was able to, within a year or two, the shop next door came up. So that's when she got the extra space. So she had the pink room that became all pink tablet that had all the evening dresses and more expensive things in it. And then the other room, was all blue with the Flamingo Park painting in it. But it was all original, really quirky things, and that was Jenny's style. And of course, in those days, in the early 70s, we were so into the 50s, the prints that I found in this incredible shop in Victoria, in Melbourne, and the Hawaiian prints, all those things. We could find all those sorts of things then. And, you know, remodeling and working with vintage things was hugely important and really acknowledging the CWA as well. They just had a hundred years which we worked on a pro on a on a fashion show in Ralston down near Mudgee last year, which was the hundred years of the CWA. Because we loved hand knitting, we loved hand sewing, that's what you did, but it was like, ooh, that's a little bit kind of crafty. But we thought that was the best. Like Jenny's jumpers are all hand knitted. I could knit and crochet so we I had hand-knitted jumpers. Everything was handmade. That's what you did. It seemed like normal. The, the thing that with you and Jenny and in those early days with um, Flamingo Park was the fact that you took that then though to an international stage. And it was the, one of the first times that Australian 
um, iconography, I guess, had really been looked at in fashion and recognised on that stage. And here were these, you know, you were, you were hand creating it. And I think that was the point. There was a lot of change then at that point, wasn't there? In 1977, Jenny and I had a government development export grant, so we could take trunks of clothes, and with Fran Moore, who was the co-producer of actually our documentary, the three of us travelled to Milan, Paris and New York with suitcases, trunks, with no wheels, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we went to Milan because Jenny had friends in Milan. We, we, we went out of PR, you took us to all the fashion shows, we changed three times a day, so that morning and afternoon and evening we'd have different outfits on, and people started following us up and down the street. This is 1977, October. It was amazing. And then we went to Paris, and we didn't. We went to a few shows there that were, were amazing, and then we went over to New York with our trunks. And I mean, we just dressed up, and we had this incredible time. And I think at that time it was like. Either of us could have left Sydney, stayed in Paris, or there could have been all that, or well, maybe you don't even want to come back to Sydney, but I did not want to stay there. Neither of us did. We wanted to get back home, and we knew what we were doing was fabulous. We proved it to ourselves, and we just wanted to stay in Australia and stay in Sydney, and then we could do anything we wanted without anyone ever beginning to even see what we were doing probably and it was in those days too that all the Australian magazines, the fashion magazines, they had a lot of Australian content which is quite different now because it's all become more international, universal but Australian Vogue, Mode, all those magazines in the 70s, especially the 70s and, the, and through the early 80s, it was all Australian content because there was not that same, you know, having to have pages and pages of all the issues of what they have now that's advertising and having had discussions with some of the editors over the years about the early days they could just get these amazing things for example with me and they travel off to do photographic shoots in Alice Springs and Broome and it was full of Australian content we were happy to be here and we could be innovative do whatever we wanted the rest of the world began to find out eventually but we were having a good time here that part of the story, I think, is incredible. It's that it's that celebration of being Australian, often at a time when that wasn't always celebrated, was seen as, as maybe not high-class fashion. And um, it's one of the things I really love about that story. And I think then that's probably a very good moment for us to segue into um, having a look at some of those early fashion items. What do you think? Sounds good. Okay, so we're going to welcome out some of our models for today. So, Lita, I'm going to get you to talk about the pieces as they come through. Okay, this is where we've gone back to 1980, no, forward now, haven't we? To 1980. These, this is one of the very first screen printing habits that I started, yeah. early days. You all look fantastic and let's thank you all. You look yes. fabulous. <laughs> and I wanted it to be just casual. But these are the really early New Zealand PowerShell inspired opals, obviously. So when Jenny and I weren't sort of working together in quite the same way, I had a studio in King's Cross where we did all the screen printing. So these go back to the really early days of experimenting with screen printing. 1981, 82, 83, using gum leaves, cut out paper stencils. Can we ask Tony to come up the front? Yeah. yeah. Let's, if the models come up here, then we can talk. I ever got really excited when I saw your early screen printing. Growing up with a mother artist who screen printed, yes. and I could never really do negative positive screen printing. I know nothing about no, negative positive. No, you said that. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was like the world opened up. So talk us through exactly how you screen print, because that's was one I do love that. Story. Yeah, well, so we were really experimenting with, once I'd been out to Lightning Ridge in 1980 and discovered Opal hugely, and then became Opal Linda, and have been going out there ever since and to all the other Queensland oval places. This is directly hand-painted through the screen. So you lay the screen on the material, 
you blob the paint on and then you swish it. <laughs> and then you swirl it around to make a painting. So, and what happened with me at that time from 1980, I didn't want to cut them up. So that's why all these early pieces have been left as huge cutout shapes because and over the last so many years with all these exhibitions, I've had a very funny, hilarious time often. Whenever I've gone through the boxes, because I've kept... Archives of Jenny and mine have gone to the NGV in Victoria, to the Powerhouse Museum, and now they, the NGA are collecting more. I've got work in the South Australian Art Gallery, the, in Darwin, and also up at the Cairns Art Gallery. So I've always, you know, I learned early on about keeping some original pieces. But that's why to um, look at some of these and remember, I didn't want to cut them up. I wanted to keep them as paintings. So it became my ulterior personality, I suppose, of having to make clothes, which was fabulous, and then not wanting to cut them up. So when I've been going through all the boxes and suddenly I pick up a piece, what I think is a piece of fabric, and it's got a hole in the middle. <laughs> it's a poncho, <laughs> like, as we see. So, over the last few years, they've been used in a few exhibitions, and of course, because I couldn't cut them up, because they had to stay like that as that big piece of cloth, and it was, it was more fun, and I guess we could just dress up like that a bit. Let's talk about, I love the, the gum leaves, and I know Brute has it on, and, um, and we also, it is on that, yeah, it is yeah. on that piece as, yeah, as well. <coughs> So starting to paint with gum leaves, we started collecting the gum leaves. What you do is you have the white cloth, and this is actually Czechoslovakian linen from my friend Ellen James, who grew up in Brisbane, and we've known each other since 1968. And her father imported Czechoslovakian linen for tea towels. So that's exactly the width of a tea towel. We had to hand wash, <laughs> we had to hand wash the linen before we printed on it. And we started collecting the gum leaves because of my research into natural dyes and things like that. So we placed the gum leaves on the material print and then keep turning them over so that we get... So we only ever printed enough to make a frock. And then we kept reprinting because people would come into the studio and say, you've got... Where do you print? There's only not a lot of space. But we only printed... The tables were probably only that long, actually because we printed small quantities, that was part of the thing that I wanted, and they were all different. So you could keep changing the colours. All of my friends had to have clothes, so they all had to have different colours, okay? <laughs> we were, I was not a mass production girl. I could not contemplate that, because none of us wanted to have the same clothes on as each other, but we all wanted something different. So it's interesting to be reminded of those times, and then all my friends started bringing in gum leaves that were different <laughs> sizes from different places, and I still have them filed in my archive in their oh. sizes. <laughs> <laughs> because once you've printed with them, if you wash them carefully and lay them flat, you keep them forever, or you leave the paint on them and they become colourful. <laughs> and the piece that Lani's wearing has the, it's the silk, isn't it? It's the pretty silk? That's silk, yeah. So, but still, we'd still start again by hand and we still print only a few metres. So perfecting the way of printing the colours to keep them like that took a bit of skill because some of the first colours all became a bit more blendy and mixed in and things like that. So yeah, these are all really, really early pieces. We have, I just, this one is just so, there's just the whole 80s look that I just love yes. happening here. Yes. And then come, you need to come forward and <laughs> it's fantastic. So this is a paper cutout stencil. There's two screens and we use paper cutout stencils. We didn't make our own screens when we eventually needed to. I always had other people do that. So you put one piece of paper down that's that swirly cutout shape. You print the rainbow, you let that dry, then you cover up the printed bit with a piece of paper and then watercolour paper I used actually. And then you could reverse it so that you put the reverse opposite colours. It took a little bit of time figuring that out, and that's how we get an opal print. Is that the same with the piece that Cherie is wearing? <laughs> so this is one of the early pieces of trying to work out how to make a black opal. So this is what That's it. So we pick the rainbow first, 
let that dry and then you have to put cut out pieces of paper which have been torn for that so it's slightly like watercolor paper because i like how the edges go a little bit blue a bit more you put the paper cutouts down and then you print black over the top it took a while to work out that to get the bright colors you have to do it on white and then put the black over the top and then you could change the black to lots of other colors as well and then we kept the pieces of paper so some of my friends would have special things made with their names on or with other special words that they wanted. So yeah, it was definitely made to order. <laughs> <laughs> and Helen, so forward, because yours is a great example as yeah, well of just being a really big piece of fabric. But I love the neckline. Yes. That's a bit of a bush print or a bush thing to wear in the bush. So these are all really, really early 80s. This is slightly inspired from PowerShell. So it's the same thing, the couple of metres of fabric laid down and then when you do the first print you get certain ways that the colours mix and then the next time it mixes slightly more. So that would have been printed just that amount to make that. Mm, and using slightly, you know, blurring the colours together so that you're, it's more painterly. And I didn't want to cut them up. So <laughs> And even working out kimono shapes, all those simple things, you'd know the first print would be the part that would be at the front, and then around the side and the other side would take about two metres, from memory, about that like, makes a good top, so, or a jacket or something like that. Thank you. Thank you to our models for that. Thank you. Thank you. They do look pretty good, by the way. Yes. So the last outfit there, you would have had to print a lot of fabric to these colours. We still didn't print a lot. And when we printed more, because the tables were quite, we only had a few metres of tables, we had to make a special metal wrap that had holes on it so that we could loop it over. Yeah. And working out how to, once it got more commercially printed, it's blending the colours that to maintain keeping the colours perfectly in the rainbow. A bit more water. Just takes a bit more perfection. Yeah. But it was still a really, really small quantity. And still we started doing hotels and things like that and then we have to learn how to print it more perfectly. So we did get better. <laughs> So, Linda, we're going to move on. Um, so those pieces we saw were early 1980s. Um, 1982, though, was the year that you and uh, Jenny decided to go in different directions with your creative partnership. Um, to you, there was sort of quite a, a difficult time for you following that, and we talked about um, a lot of um, introspective, introspection, a lot of, sort of self um, exploration, I guess, in that time, in that sort of decade following that for you. Would you like to speak about that a little bit more as well? I guess when you've been working together, and lots of people ask us about this, because what they thought at the time is that we'd argued and we didn't get on and, like, you know, everyone had to kind of think, do we need to go on that side or that side, which is often what happens and what was happening with some people in fashion who'd been working together in those days, but it wasn't like that for us because Jenny was expanding much more into doing the art and having her own things printed and doing all that sort of thing. And then I was wanting to have a studio where I could do all the screen printing. So it just began to quite nicely divide itself into our different, and because we'd always respected each other's difference in the beginning, it just began to make more sense because she had her fabulous shop I didn't want a shop, I wanted a studio space because I always had a workroom because everything in my place, I had a workroom in Bondi Road actually which was fantastic and you know when we used to meet the Paris Cake Shop was across the road so we'd have that, then we went to Chinatown. So eventually in 1981 found this fantastic building space that we could rent in William Street in King's Cross and it's actually now above where King Street Galleries is in William Street in King's Cross, so we had the whole top floor, which had an incredible parquet floor. It was a really beautiful space. It was probably as big as this whole studio, actually. It was rather large. And the whole thing was that we could have, you know, I had a small team of the gorgeous ladies who did sewing, and we did it with the small table, a bit of the printing, and I had 
a stage built at one end, even bigger than that actually, that with a gold frame around it so that we could do our theatrical events because I still wanted to do shows, but in a more smaller theatrical way than what our shows with, that, that we did together had happened because they got bigger and bigger. You know, the last one we did was um, in a nightclub, the one before was at the Sydney Town Hall. They were getting huge, bigger and bigger and becoming incredible events, but were still with Michael Ramsden's hand-painted backdrops and things like that. So for me, I wanted to have, I love theatre, Martha Graham performance, different things like that. So that's what I wanted to do in my studio space. And then also be able to make things to order. So it, we were settling into doing things that were quite different. So we weren't really competitive in a way, and that's how it settled, and it began to work quite fantastically, actually, because of that thing of Jenny doing all the sort of things that she wanted, and through those years, and I had become completely obsessed with Opal. I didn't have a vault room quite as big as that, but I did have a large safe, and I had lots of Opal exhibitions, and it was something that I was completely involved in, and it was also, the beginnings of going out to, wanting to go out to Alice Springs, that was all 1980. And I think we did speak about um, sort of the night, end of 1980s and then 1992, and that um, being quite a significant year for you. Um, you had, because you travelled, there was lots of things happening at that time for you. Do you want to, would you happy to elaborate on that? Going out to Central Australia and things like that, yeah, because that year we went out to Lightning Ridge and I also went out to Central Australia and that's when I first met the women from Utopia Station and wanting to be out, able to go out more to communities and learn a lot about land and culture and things like that. And the women from Utopia were doing incredible batik and they also, that same year, after I'd been to Alice Springs, they were coming into Sydney to be part of the Crafts Council, quite a huge exhibition with their batiks, and they invited me to go out to their community the next year to be able to, because they were doing batik on t-shirts, but they wanted to, they thought they should get more into maybe fashion or something like that. So it was the beginning of, you know, making clothes. So it was a thrill for me to go out, because I made my own swag, of course, as you have to, which I still have, with the hand-printed fabrics because of going out into Utopia. So how that worked at that time, the women had been taught the batik via connecting to Indonesia, having some Indonesian textile artists come to visit them, and eventually they also did go into Indonesia. So they had that same technique with the wax, hot wax, and doing the dipping and the dyeing and things like that. So. It was amazing for me to see that they sat, because most people think of that techniques of dyeing of stretching, flat, but because of the heat, they could ease. They just sat and just did incredible drawings like this of what were like their paintings that you see now, quite flexible and flowing. And in the heat, they'd be easily dyed, dry within a few minutes really, because it's pretty hot out there, and then do another layer of the paint. So within the Utopia community, there were a couple of what they called outstations, and the women would be from certain different families. We'd visit one family of women in their sort of camp and take more cloth for them to do their dyeing on, and we would collect their, their beautiful textiles that they'd done, which would then be sold. So it was great, and I met Emily, who was incredibly famous, and it was, I gave them, I made bags because I know I knew the ladies all about bags, so I gave them all these bags and they pinned them onto their frocks and we just had this incredible time together and it was they laughed at me with the clothes I was wearing because <laughs> and we got some very funny photos of that as well. They wanted to try all the things on because it was good for them to see they didn't really want to wear the clothes then for me. I thought they would, but their thing was it was more of an art, which is really interesting to look back on. It, they saw that as art. And it was after that that they began to paint on canvas, which of course, when that started, that's when all of us had problems with this issue because the minute you paint on canvas, it becomes an art piece and it's much more valuable. And that's what happened that changed radically what did happen out of Utopia. But in those early days, they weren't thinking that they were going to wear the clothes. Like now, I'm thrilled to see 40 something years later that 
so many of the younger ones who their mothers and grandmothers are the ones doing the early things, they're the ones, they all want to wear their own textiles and things, which is fantastic. So there's a photograph of me with Emily because they're saying, I had too many clothes on. <laughs> and so we counted the clothes and we had exactly the same number of skirts and tops. <laughs> and it's quite funny because that's the way they love to dress. They can, you know, put the layers on, peel them off and everything. And because most of the people who went out to communities were more the jeans and the ordinary, you know, like I had to wear, I had to dress up when I went to visit them. I had to wear their textiles, of course. And so it was so wonderful to see how they worked and we've documented all this and so, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible, the photographs and everything. And, yeah, to see some of those photographs is really amazing and it's, it's wonderful to see how all that evolved. And so what happened, I used to make up white cotton clothes, very simple shapes, and also little leggings and things, and send them out to the women, and they would batik on them because of the way that they just sat. They didn't have to stretch the fabric, and then dye them, and then send them back to me. So some of those pieces are now in the collection, because I've always kept a few. Some of those pieces are in the NGB collection, and also in the South Australian Art Gallery collection, because I kept some of those the original because often you could keep some of the original pieces knowing you could make a lot of things to order. But I always made sure I kept a few, so I always had so some of those early pieces are now in those collections. And that, that actually really started a lifelong connection for you with First Nations communities, didn't it? And working particularly with women in those communities. Yeah, definitely. Because what I discovered, and then I would get invited, of course, which I'd always say yes, to go to Alice Springs and take suitcases and, you know, when you have, you could have excess baggage and say, yeah, put those six suitcases <laughs> on my it's not a problem. Going in and out of communities and going into Alice Springs and being able to dress up everybody. And once they knew that I loved doing things like that, well, of course, the minute someone rang, I'd say, where am I going? It would always, I just loved it. It was and a great way to connect and learn about culture and stories and things like that. And yeah. I got to, with my studio in King's Cross, it was actually quite around the corner from the museum in Sydney. And there was one time there were a group of women from Yundamu in, in doing some special event at the museum and I invited them to come to my studio. So of course, with their art coordinator at the time, it was only a bit of a walk up the road. And when they saw all the gum leaf prints and things, they sat in my studio and sang songs about them, which was so special and so beautiful. And Yundamu was a place that I did go and visit to quite a lot and got to know lots of the women in those days and do different projects. And But mostly I just loved working in the art centre. So um, just so in canvas and I got really good at making cups of tea. I did get a Billy Can Award for making the best cups of tea, which I still have that painting, which I found recently it was quite sweet. Yeah, just, I wanted to know more, and I, you know, if, if you're that, if you feel that that's the way you want to be able to be within the community and be, have a simple life, I was, I, I was thrilled to be able to have, be able to do that, and there were quite a lot of different artists, women mostly, at that time, because usually it was the women's centre was the place where an art centre often started because it was the place in the community where they had washing machines and the women would gather a bit more and then they sort of started, you know, someone could be there to help do a bit more artwork and so often they'd say, especially once Utopia had started, lots of the communities would say, look, can we have more people coming? We want to do more artwork. And so to be there in the late 70s, early 80s and witness things like that happening and now in communities, art centres are huge, which is uh, like thrilling. And there were some communities that had huge art centres happening in those days anyway. So to witness that for me and be able to be a part, because I did love camping out in the swag, and if you're okay to have a simple life like that, you can, quite, you can fit in. You ended up at Arnhem Land as well, didn't you? That was post that time, and then and then sort of then moved in then into Northern Queensland. You, you really, but always making that connection with those those First Nations communities and the women particularly. 
Or to do with my studio and the yes. screen printing yes. problems and yes. things like that. Yeah. She's good, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I can meander off, but yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because of all our screen printing and we had a beautiful big space, I began to get incredible, which is something I've always had to tell people to be careful of. I developed incredible reactions to the screen printing paint. So it can either happen to you or not. I became really ill. I didn't want to be living in Sydney. I just, it was becoming quite tragic actually. So once the whole thing, and you try to work out what it is, you're having uh, you know, reactions and you don't quite know and it takes quite a few years to figure out what's actually happening. And I would start palpitating and breathing and not, you know, running around and, you know, having to lie down and being really weird and my face puffing up and everything. And eventually worked out that I was really sick from the screen printing paint. But when we started printing, this is part of my way I work, I went to where they made the paint in the early 80s. I wanted to know exactly what it was and, you know, they said it was fine because then people didn't really know that some of those you know, things, it's not as bad as, I mean, it can't be a smell of oil paint and things like that. So it wasn't as bad as that, but, you know, it did have an effect on me. And it's something, when I've been to communities and doing workshops and things that always discuss the fact that you, it's a good idea to find out what you're working with. So I was told that it was fine. So, and we had, you know, a beautiful big space. We had airflow, we had all these things, but you know, for me, even though you can wear a mask, it's not to do with the mask, it's to do with being in that space all the time and it can penetrate your skin. It's not just breathing in. So and then I had to decide I have this incredible life and I've got this incredible, beautiful team of, you know, a few beautiful sewers and people and things like that and it was everyone saying, Look, you have, you are the one you have to make the decision if it's... Nobody wants you to say this, but then I have to say, look, I, I can't do this anymore. And then it's, you have to work out what to do. And then, you know, when you're, like I was just saying before, you go, well, the ship's going down, or, you know, the captain, blah, blah, blah. And then I figured out, I am the ship. I'm going down. So we have to look after everybody and work out how to make all that work, where does everyone go that I've been working with for? Because we're all like a huge, big, beautiful, big, or small, not big, it was only well, half a dozen people really, you know, family and everything, and work out what to do. So it was pretty radical, and, but through that time, because of working in communities and wanting to be more out in our springs and places like that, I was able to actually go and relocate into Arnhem Land and work at Owen Pelly in your like arts with their textile to help. So what they wanted me to be there for, which fitted in with me knowing, you know, being able to collaborate with the, the director at the time of the community there, of the art centre, was for me to go for quite a few months, six months or so, to be able to encourage the women to come into their community more, because they were incredibly famous for their amazing bark paintings, which I've always loved the bark paintings probably from whenever I first saw them. And to, to be there, for me to be in the studio, have days, have it, set up a space so that some of the young girls and the ladies could come in and just sit around and just become more a part of the community. So I left Sydney and went as far away as I could within the country into <laughs> Arnhem Land. Thank you. And we did talk about, you know, and how important that was for you then in, in you know, to use a very cliche term, but in finding yourself and sort of recalibrating where you were going with your life as well at that point, um, point two. So um, I think, you know, we said that, I said it right at the start, I mean, you, you know, the collaboration with Jenny Key and, and the initial start and what was going on then is well known, but the, the work you've done, the collaborations since then have also been huge and significant. Of course, there was Bush Couture, which was your own label, and that was early, early yeah, 80s. Yep, yeah. yeah, and we looked at some of those um, garments then. But also then that you've gone on since then to do incredible collaborations and, I mean, you've spent... They are. 
right, so we are going to move on to look at some of the newer works that you've created and um, some of the collaborations that have come about as part of that. Well, we have to thank digital printing now, except the first <coughs> where we should with her Waratah. She's turning to the front yep. of her Waratah, yes. So this has all been hand-painted Oakley style, all the pieces of silk over the years. And I've done lots of different workshops in all those techniques in the past. And then this was scarves, actually. And then I've printed the Waratah, screen printed the Waratahs over the top. So it's a, it's a lengthy process of, they were actually all silk scarves. I did all the painting and then that dries and then I printed the Waratahs over the top. So it's quite a lengthy process. And this was another collaboration with Romance Was Born actually, because quite a few of these pieces are. And this was for a film that Sia made, the singer, incredible singer. And it was a collaboration for her to make the film. You've seen, I forget the name of it actually. Oh, sorry, no, we can't remember the name. <laughs> They made a lot of costumes for her, and one of those was one of the costumes that was part of the film that she did make, which was amazing. So all these pieces here that we're looking at, these are part of the collaboration with Romance Was Born in 2015. So I hand-painted all the fabrics. They would then translate them into a digital print. Sometimes what was really quirky, and the same with this one I'm wearing, this was a huge shibbly gum shape and romance made it tiny. Now the deal was, I was the artist, they were the designers, so whatever they wanted to do with the artwork, I always agreed because I loved to witness what they were doing and it was pretty amazing. And so that was a collage of what was part of the painting on the first one with the Waratahs over the front that they had digitally printed. And Lani, is that right? Yeah, Lani. That's another print. So they cut up all my prints and had that digitally printed as an overall print. And which I rather loved. And another one that we did with Romance was I hand painted all this beautiful Waratah cloth and I, that I stretched on a Brain that was as big as the screen behind us. And then I give it to Luke and he cuts it up into bits. <laughs> and I nearly die. Because it's like, oh my God, I, because me, I couldn't have cut it up. And that's why to collaborate with them, that's the agreement is I'm giving it to you. I'm, I'm going to watch what you do. And it was really actually quite fantastic to I see suddenly he get the scissors and snip something that I had done. But I was the artist, so I was thrilled to be the artist with them. And that's been quite an amazing, that's been quite an amazing recent collaboration with Romance Was Born. Is everyone aware of the label Romance Was Born and the significance of them? Yes, yeah, people are aware of that. Okay, can we brag now? Yeah, you go. Do you want to brag? You brag. They just posted all these photographs of York yeah. wearing one of our collaborations from 2015 as a surprise for me to see that she wore this in Perth at her performance last night. So some of the collaborations that we've done, because they're over the top special incredible pieces, which is what you do when you do an incredible big fashion show like that, that we did at the, um, the National Gallery in, in New South, I keep getting them all excited. <laughs> No, the one, the um, New South Wales Art Gallery, they chose to do their show in 2015 in the space, which was very beautiful actually. So that frock was hand printed blue sea urchin and the set that Bjork had, it looked as if we'd made it so especially poor. It was completely extraordinary mm -hmm. and, and amazing to see all these photographs, like what a surprise. <laughs> and you had no idea that she was going to wear it. No, because usually they often lend things to the odd performance or singer like that. So possibly that's how that worked. But she might have chosen that. I have to check with Luke because we haven't spoken because I've been a bit busy yeah. talking to 
working out our show. <laughs> so I desperately had time for no, had I? <laughs> to find out that she must have seen it for her to have chosen it to fit in exactly with that performance that she did that looked amazing because the romance was born, their studio space now is a beautiful huge space they've got for a couple of years, well quite a few years they've been there now, in, within the Powerhouse Museum. They have a, it's as big as this space, it's beautiful. So they make everything, their archives are there, and a lot of their archives are actually now going into the Powerhouse Museum, which is fantastic. So some of the works that we did together have already gone to the Victoria National Gallery and to the Canberra National Gallery and going to the Powerhouse. So there's obviously a couple, and that's what they do, you know, they dress up performers and singers and that's the sort of thing that I do as well. It's good fun dressing people, aren't you? Like Would you like to do, I think it's a moment to do a little bit of name dropping because you have, you have I mean, you know, Ringo's uh, oh, well, yes, yes yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there have been some amazing I mean we're just starting. I have written that down because, oh, you wrote wait, well, like, because we can't trust my memory oh, no. so, yeah. I have got uh, the Ringo Star one is quite cute because of Penelope Tree, who is a dear friend and a model in the sixties. When lots of her she came to live in Sydney because she didn't want to stay living in America, she wanted her ch children to grow up in, in Australia, which was, you know, and we all became really close friends and she was the model in one of my shows, which was, you know, pretty amazing because we're such dear friends. And um, so when Ringo, when anyone came out that was from London like that, because they knew, they'd often come because of knowing Penelope anyway, and that's how lots visited Jenny in the shop and then would come to my studio, but what? Ringo and his wife Maureen, she got a beautiful outfit and got a great photograph of them actually. He had this opal um, earring and a ring and so I sent them off to my opal friends because I'm being opal obsessed and everything and they told them they were triplets and they went and my opal friends was because that's what they'd been given in 1964 when they came to Australia were opals but they weren't Solid so ovals. The Beatles. Yeah, the Beatles. Oh. Yeah, them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so things you find out. They wouldn't be given that as a gift for coming to Australia. I know it's a little, you know, you don't think about that in the paper, do you? <laughs> so I sent them off to Bird or Opals, my friends, and they, you know, it wasn't all the Beatles in any way, but it was Ringo, and then, you know, so he got another whole proper things of proper Opals, which was good fun. Yeah. But, but Marsha Hines I dressed a lot. Yes. And there's a Ralston retro record shop in Candos, no, in Ralston, mm -hmm. near Mudgee. Yes. And I go in there one day and there's the three albums of Marsha. I had to buy them, I haven't got them. <laughs> With her still wearing the outfits. But they were from the 70s, early days. And she's given me two of the outfits that she wore then. She gave them back to me and said, you're not getting the other ones. So. <laughs> and I've given them to the Powerhouse Museum. And Deborah Conway, Sweet Ends was their final. Yep. That was fun, making their linen suits for their final. Because you have dressed a lot of musicians, haven't you? I have, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think, I'm David Bowie. Was known for well, they, he, he bought yep. things in the, in the shop, yeah. Yep. So Via Loren, Lauren McCall. Yeah, because yeah, they would pop into the shop. But for me, the main to order thing was lots of the musicians over the years. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Absolutely, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think we mentioned it quickly, I do just want to touch on the difference and what we spoke a bit about this, we looked at the first pieces that we spoke about had the hand printing, but we were talking Linda about the way that, sorry, <clears throat> and my voice is going a bit, the way that um, the, the change to digital printing has completely changed the way that you can create. And if we're looking at the opal pieces particularly, I think um, Helen, Helen is wearing one. Do you come yeah. forward and tell, tell the story of that piece? Please. So because of my Opal Linda and Lightning Rich collection, this is, it's actually one scarf, but when the scarves are printed four and across, I always wanted them printed four across so then I could make me an outfit to wear, which is that. So a scarf is a separate single scarf, but this is exactly how they're printed. So they're printed four across, they're not square. I really have preferred rectangle scarves more to the square 
scarf. And this is actually from Sue White, who is has an opal mine out near Yawa, and over the years of going out to Lightning Ridge since 1980, and from 2000 onwards, when they had their, they started their big opal. Every year they have an opal event in Lightning Ridge. Every second year they started an opal jewelry competition, of which I'd be often involved in, dressing up, take more clothes, dress up all the girls <laughs> on the night because they'd have a show sometimes of. They do it quite like this actually, and. You know, we'd wear all the winning jewellery and the girls, I'd dress all the girls up and they'd have to walk around the tables and show everybody the winning pieces and things like that. So this is actually from Sue White. It's $60 million worth of opals. They're real photographs of the opals. So I painted the background and with digital printing, that gets digitally printed. It's all with Penny, with Think Positive in Sydney. Then I had all the photographs printed it's very labour intensive. I do not do any of this on the computer. I'm a cut out and paste person. Every photograph of the opal was cut out and over the top of the painted print, I lay plastic and then I have to stick the photograph of the opal. This was really labour intensive. Stick the photograph of the opal and number them because then Penny had to match up every photograph of every opal to match where they went on the print because I had written the names of every single opal and always had a name around every opal. So it was quite labour intensive, but I am not the person to do the technical computer work. I do still the cut out and paste with paper and drawing and I hand it over to the experts. It's the only way to go. <laughs> so I think, and this is another opal piece. That's good, because this one's also got the Waratah printed over the top, is it? No, that's the, the one underneath has oh, the Waratah, the right so it's the blend, it's the same, slightly different blended opal, and then I have done a drawing. So the opal parts worked out first, and then I've done the drawing of the black lines of the opal, of the, sorry, of the Waratah print over the top. But the, you can see a black line that goes across that, that would be the scarf, but I asked Penny to print that into fabric for me. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. Um, so... Yeah, I've talked about all the outfits, lovely. Yeah. Thank you. You to our models. Lucky well, um, they all fold up really small and fit it into a couple of suitcases. <laughs> when Julie Apo said to me, oh, can you bring a few extra things up? Because of, I have to acknowledge Julie Apo, actually, because, because Julie is amazing. And we met in 2011 up in Cairns. Julie's a Gorang Gorang artist, which you probably might know who Julie is. And she couldn't be here today because of some project that she's working on. And we met up at the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair and I had already done some, some um, digital scarves with Moss and Gorge because I was working there for quite a long time with the community. And she said, look, we'll keep in touch. And she invited me to come down. She got a grant for me to come to be in Bundaberg in 2014 to work with her on some really special projects. So, and then Julie also then, when she was beginning to work on a whole new thing that she's doing with the hand-painted clothes and everything, which was at the Moncrief Gallery. She asked me if I wanted to be involved in that, so with the grant that you put together, that enabled me to be here now. And it's because of that, of coming on the 1st of January, that Madam here then asked me, would I, did I want to have fun and have lunch? And of course I said yes. Never backward Never backwards. No, that's the only way to go. So, I love Bundaberg, and my father was born in Warwick, so I've always had a Queensland connection, which I've always had to drive past Guy Street in Warwick to photograph it, the street sign again, again, I know it's pretty silly really, but to send it down to my brother and go, hey look, this is where Dad was born. And actually I just remember today that my parents lived in a suburb out of Brisbane for about six years in, the, through the 70s actually, which is, I've always had this fabulous Queensland connection. Mm -hmm. yeah, which is wonderful. It's lovely to be building on that with you now. <laughs> um, so we are going to, um, I 
want to leave some time for questions. So, I do, you have mentioned a few times um, the gallery associations, Linda, and um, so um, National Gallery of Victoria, National Gallery of Australia, Powerhouse Museum, uh, the uh, Gallery of South Australia as well. So, I think what's been really interesting for me, and we've discussed a lot, is that the the collecting of textiles and the recognition of your works as artworks that are now part of their textile collections and what that has meant for you and the change that that's meant in your career. Would you like to talk about that as well? Well, I think it's, it's interesting because of when I lived in Paris in 1970, the end of 1970, I met this fantastic woman who worked as a journalist and she took me to a Dior show, which was really amazing, actually, to be sitting on the gold seats and looking at a Dior show. And then I did get to meet Madame Grey as well, which was extraordinary. She had a show in Melbourne at George's and the director of her company I met. And then when I went to Paris with Jenny in 1977, I got to meet Madame Grey and went to her salon. And the whole thing of the inspiration of that way of working, that you keep the original collection, you show it like what we've done today, and if any of you wanted to buy that flock, you would then pay a fortune probably, <laughs> which they would have, and what they do now, which is how it works, and you would have it made especially for you. So observing those things in those early days, I guess just was a part of for me, some of the works that I made that then I photographed Jenny in, like the black cockatoo dress, the gum leaf dress, a few of those ones for me were special pieces and I would keep them in my studio. And we didn't know then that we were our work was going to be collected, but I kept them because they were important to me and I didn't really make it to sell, to put in a shop. I didn't put them into Jenny's shop in those early 70s. I kept it because it was a piece of art for me I'd photographed it in the bush on Jenny, mostly in the early, in all those early days, and th that was what was important. So the learning of that, and then over the years, for us realising that what we were doing was actually had value, and the same with the textiles, and the original pieces were like the art piece that becomes worth something. And for me, you look back on those pieces, and it inspires you to do something else, or to work on it a bit more or it, they were just very important and I just learned early on and then later on when, when one starts to discover that the NGA bought pieces of ours early 1980, the, and the National Gallery in New South Wales in Sydney was the first one to have an art clothes exhibition in 1980. It's like, that was amazing. I mean, they haven't continued anything like that which is pretty extraordinary because they were the first ones actually to involve Jenny, me, David McDermott, Peter Tully, Jenny Bannister and a few other artists to have an art clothes exhibition, which is what they called it. Pretty radical in those days and the documentation of all that was, was amazing. And then the understanding became maybe these art clothes is what they're becoming called. Maybe they are worth something much more than... It's a whole different thing if... I mean, I made clothes that everybody could wear daily, wash them, hang them on the line, put them back on, go camping, wear a black frock, go to the ball, dress up, do whatever. But there was also the other art part of it that was, you know, it was divided into a few separate sort of entities, I think. And I think that's been really interesting in the what I think that's been really interesting in the way that galleries have collected and exhibited your works. And I know that the collaboration with Romance has been, that was recently at the um, National Gallery of Australia, they've been showcasing some of those works, I know. Yeah. Um, and of course you had the, um, the Step into Paradise, which was of course um, the, amazing. the beautiful book and of course that um, huge exhibition with Jenny Key. And if anyone hasn't seen it, there is also of course the documentary on ABC that is still and showing still as well. Sleep under the veranda. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. If you haven't seen it, you do need to watch that. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. And you're about to star in a new documentary as well about Australian fashion history, you and Jenny, I believe, as well. Well, yeah, this is something that's quite... It's, how did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
It's called The Way We Wore, and it's the whole, it's, we've only just, Jenny and I have done a few bits of it, but they'll, they're interviewing quite a few other fashion people, etc., etc., and it won't come out till November, so it's really early days, and I think it's on the ABC, but it's a pretty quirky, interesting look at what was going on then for us. What did we wear? Or I thought, what a great title. So, you know, we've done a few, we did our little interviews when I was just down in Sydney. So who knows what way that will come out? Because with a documentary, it can, it, you know, it'll have its twists and turns, and I guess it depends what happens with all the other people that they talk to. You know, what, what will it look like? And they wanted some early photos of, you know, and, you know, it'll be pretty quirky, I'd say. <laughs> But you've done some amazing, you know, there'd be some really interesting recognition as well, because you had the powerhouse float for Pride for the Mardi Gras, which was just incredible. <laughs> that was amazing, because they sponsored a float to be built, and then we had all these incredible meetings about, it, okay, it should be called Step Into Paradise, and then this incredible artist which we had so many meetings with. We put all our ideas forth, and there had to be flamingos, and there had to be colour, and all that. And then we, we have all these meetings and see all these incredible artworks. And so, you know, Jenny and I would have to come to an agreement about, and then with the team, about the ones that we love the most. And then to see that come to life, and then I made huge turbans for us to wear, of course, because, and it was only us two on the slope, because, you know, Sometimes they had lots of people on the float, and so Jenny was on one side, I was on the other side. It was really amazing to be involved. That was 2019, which is an incredible memory because then they didn't have another event until this year because of you know lockdown and COVID and everything. So it was great to be there and honour Peter Tully and David McDermott and all these you know amazing artists and people who helped like Peter created. And to see, when I was just in Sydney, luckily, to be able to see some of William Young's shows and to see photographs of the Imelda Marcos shoes and all these things that Peter Tully and David McDermott created and invented was amazing. I think there's a, I think it's a really interesting, I don't know whether it's designable, but it's just that, that flow of how things happen and how, how life moves. And we have had um, Tony's come back out again um, in, we are talking about the collaboration with romance. I think this is one of, um, similar to some of the works I know I've seen um, in the collection, in some of their collections. So do you want to talk about the level of work? And it's quite special. You look fabulous. Yes. yes. And of course, I don't get into it. So when I, this is one of the romance works that we collaborated on. So Anna and Luke wanted to do the Waratah sequence. And so Luke cut out the shape of the dress and he, he printed large size photographs of my Waratah paintings and he asked me, he laid it flat on the table and said, will you put the Waratahs in the position that you like? And then it was sent off to Pakistan, I think, actually, and then sequined. That looks amazing. And that was part of, I think, the one that they had in their show was actually full length. So they did a couple that was more saleable, sort of, I guess, that, you know, more cocktail length. And the Waratah scarf was my artwork that I painted that was with Oriton when they were doing their scarves, and that was 1989. And that was actually hand, I went to the factory in Japan. That was one of my traits of always wanting to go to the place where things were made so that I knew how people were being treated. I could see the working conditions. I knew what the fabrics and the textiles were. So I was in Japan and I went to the factory where they actually printed that. And I was amazed because I thought it would be you know, modern technology, and I felt like I was in, you know, whatever century in Japan. It was hand printed, and the tables were that shape. They weren't flat, and the screens were exactly the width of the 36 inches square, and they had copied, that scarf has probably got nearly 15 screens. So, because of my watercolour painting, and I didn't know how they did this, it looks exactly like the watercolour painting, so they showed me the way that they make the separate screens, which is really interesting. 
to get, like with the shades of pink, there's probably five different screens just for the pink. To layer the colours in tiny dots and different, it's not a digital print. And it was amazing to see how quickly they printed, because it's 36 inches square, printing all the colours, and the building was a beautiful, huge, big old wooden building, and then they put wooden slats underneath the silk, and then it was all raised up to the ceiling. And when I looked up, there was layers and layers of all the silk that they'd already printed. Then water came out, for people who know about printing the table's flat, water came out the top of the join between the two and ran down the, ran down the tables that were sloped. They washed them. They were like they were doing karate or something. <laughs> well, they were samurai printers, I reckon. And then dried it and then got the roll of silk, laid another piece and used these big flat pieces to flatten the silk again and then start printing again. It was awesome to see. And I wanted to say then that these were hand printed, but Oriton did not want to say that. They didn't think that was the right thing to do, but it was 1989. But now more people would say things like that because it's more talked about. And now Helen is our last outfit for this afternoon. And I love the way that, I mean, it's, we've gone from this very um, beautiful bead piece, but the way you created this piece, I think, is really interesting. It's possibly got a slight bit of African influence of West Africa and for the shape, and I did make quite a few costumes and thin tops like that for a lot of my African musician friends, but that has been printed laid flat on the table and then pleated up on the table. So it might be three metres long and then it gets pleated up carefully into being a metre and a half long. And then we print over the top with the colours and then when you undo it, you've got that particular <coughs> pleated look. And you look fantastic. Everyone's been looking amazing by the way. Haven't they? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you to our models. That was well, thank you to our models. That was lovely. Um, we are going to open the floor for some questions, um, as I have um, led all of the questions so far. Be um, will we do a little bit of announcing before we open the floor to questions? Do you think? Over to you. Over to me for that one. <laughs> Um, so we've seen today, you know, Linda's spoken about her love of opals, her connections to Queensland, and we have of course seen today some of the opal um, garments that Linda has created in the fabric. So I'm actually really excited today to announce that um, Linda is going to collaborate with Bunbury Regional Galleries to bring her first opal exhibition to us at the end of 2024. Yeah. <laughs> So um, that will, um, it will be, we're charting a lot of different stories in that. We're charting um, some childhood stories, connections with your father and his connections to Queensland. Also the Opal Works and um, we have also had some discussions about there being some new Linda Jackson um, collaborative works created specifically for that exhibition. So um, it's a wonderful coup for our gallery and I'm thrilled and excited about the opportunity to work with Linda on that. So thank you Linda. <laughs> We started having a discussion, then suddenly I go, oh, I'm in Queensland, <laughs> and this can be, yeah, I was just over there, you know, Quilpie, all the oval fields of where I, with Berkeley Opals, when I first worked with opals, was all about Boulder Oval, because I loved the Boulder Oval, and that was the first pieces that I fell really madly in love with, because then they used to be called fun stones. <laughs> because nobody, they didn't have the value of all the rest of the opal, so we could make all these mad, wild, fabulous, creative things. And, you know, I've still got a little bit of that collection, so I think we'll show some of that early collection and then we'll do some other wild things and we're going to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm moving in. We just <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I'm going to open the floor up to questions. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Trudy, I love it. Oh, I've got a question. Hi, Linda. I'm always struck by your layering of your outfits. It's always super impressive. I mean, today <coughs> you're magnificent in your layers. I'd love to hear more about 
how or why, you know, what's, how that comes about, why is layering important to you, and how do you come up with the amazing shapes that you get to? It means I can peel them all off and go swimming. <laughs> There's a thing. I'm still wearing the similar shapes for the last such a long time. So there's a skirt that's underneath, or that could be pants. I mean, I've got skirts on now. Or, and then there's a dress that I wear that's a really simple shape that's sort of stretchy. And actually, I think I've been wearing this probably since the 80s, really. So it's a one shoulder, it goes across like that, and then it's quite skinny. So that, and now that I'm getting, because I've lived in all these different places, and I'm getting the wardrobes from Alice Springs Melbourne having to be in Bendigo around quite a bit because of wanting to be close to mum and dad and mum passed away just before COVID, thank heavens, that was you know such a blessing. The winter clothes, the Port Douglas clothes, the bush clothes and the Sydney dress up clothes, bringing all those things together. So many things are almost identical shapes but they're all slightly different. And how we worked with the shop with Flamingo Park in the beginning was, which has been interesting to talk about too actually, is that we put all these slightly different things in and what weekly, we didn't do big collections like everybody does now. We always, Jenny and I worked towards doing our fabulous show at the end of the year that could be quite, what's our inspiration and we'd work on all these things. But we put all these simple things, the skirts and the tops and the, whatever sold first is what we keep making. And that's how that worked. But it was usually the things that were simple that anybody could wear except they were quite colourful, you had to love colour, and that's, that was our thing. But I still made a lot of black clothes, which lots of friends have worn out completely, and used calico to make even the same simple shapes that lots of friends have worn out completely. So the other side of what the colour was, that that's what everybody was looking at, there was always the other plain colours that were in the pure cottons or pure silk that some friends have still got. If they got the small waist, I've been given a few things back from some of my friends that they had made in the 80s that have got tiny waists, and I've been able to give them to the NGB or to my goddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky her. <laughs> have we got any other questions? I'm oh, right, I can speak. Oh. Um, Jenny, I understand that I can't cut moment. Um, did you ever? To counteract that, create art directly on an already made article of clothing. Did you do that often? Or? No, that's a good question. I made my own clothes and we did have patterns, but I started cutting out my own things anyway. And then I went to Emily McPherson College of Domestic Economy when I was 15. <laughs> It's RMIT now, but Mum had taken me at Mentone Girls High School I went to. She said, you know, Linda, whenever I ask you, you say you want to do everything. So she must have had a meeting at the school. They recommended that at age 15, I go into the city of Melbourne and go to what's now part of RMIT. And it was old-fashioned sewing, pattern making, weaving. I loved it, everything. And it meant I was free and I was in the city of... It was by Morris, it's an hour on the train into the city. And then my first job was in a bridal salon in Sports Girl on the top floor. <laughs> Downstairs was groovy, fabulous, and upstairs, it was in Collins Street, upstairs was classic, old-fashioned bridal salon. And I really wanted to be a fashion illustrator then, like sewing was what I could do, but I love painting and drawing, and Mum has kept my... I used to do the drawings of the wedding gowns, this is me, I'm 16, with white paint on black paper that used to go on the wall with the names of the wedding dresses on the bottom and my dear mum kept a couple of those. But the lady who was head of the workroom, she cut out, they made wedding dresses to order. So you could get a wedding dress made to order, you had it made specially to fit you and she cut out the patterns without a pattern. She used a tape measure and pins and measured a made to order. So learning things like that was amazing then and they would make that dress, you'd either keep that gown or you could hire it and it would go back into their hiring section, which I think some bridal salons still do things like that. So that was very special and so I could make patterns, I still could make a pattern, 
I can actually cut out a perfect sleeve to fit into the pattern without a pattern. Because I'm a smarty pants. <laughs> and, because of, and because of just something that I loved that I could do, and then over the years making things, we did make patterns, but we also made twiles in calico, which was, that's how the bridal salon worked. And it's also, when the NGV had the Dior show, they, for two weeks they had the women from the Dior Salon make the calico twiles, which is what they were called, and then you'd make the patterns from that. So they'd make that to fit. And we worked a bit the same way in the studio. So, and then once you start cutting out, I could still cut out shapes with a pattern or without a pattern, but it was easier once you get to know with measuring and things that you don't need the pattern. And you just have to experiment and mess it up and keep practicing and then you're fine. And then did you ever screen print onto any of the articles of clothing you actually Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we could print on the flat piece or we could print on a made up dress which you could lay flat because they were always either cotton or silk. And then you'd get all these really quirky shapes. So that definitely became part of how we did that as well. You have to let it dry and then you flip it over. Yeah. It's very easy. <laughs> I'm just watching our time, but I'd love to take one more question from the floor if someone has got another question. No? Has anyone got another question? No. no. Just a comment oh. yep. that I'm absolutely impressed how modest this lady is. Where would be your favourite destination? Like, where was your favourite place to live over all your travels? Here. <laughs> <laughs> in our country, but I guess across it, I only got my driving licence age 48. Everyone else drove around me. I lived in Bondi, Fran, the only one we could, they all drove, so I never had to get my driving licence then. And then I was flown out to all these remote communities, which I loved, and I'd be on the air, you know, the mail plane or whatever. You'd be in a community, everyone else drove. I didn't, and then I knew I had to learn to do it. And my darling partner that I was with through the 90s, and um, he couldn't believe that I couldn't drive, we were living in Alice Springs, and he really encouraged me to get my license, and he was really supportive. And one day with the driving, I had to have the driving instructor, you've got to start, you know. Mum and Dad helped me as well get the L, you know, I had to read the book. They said one time, I had the book from New South Wales, I had the book from, you know, I had to learn the instructions, I had the book from Queensland, I had the book from, Western Australia, I had the book from the Northern Territory, and I'm in Victoria, and Mum and Dad said, look, we think you need to, you really want to learn to drive, so yeah, I got the L, you know, I did the, the test and got the thing to learn to drive, but then was back in Alice Springs, and one day the driving instructor said, does your husband know you're learning to drive? And I said, actually, yes, he's really supportive. He says, oh, I'm so glad to hear that, because a lot of the ladies who are learning to drive now are learning to drive in secret, and they're going to pick up their husband from work when they got, when they got their license. <laughs> but that was 1998, 1997 in Alabama. <laughs> and I passed with flying colours, even though I did a shocking reverse power. <laughs> and I thought I failed, and then I thought, I just drove. And then, of course, I got my license. And I've driven hundreds of thousands of kilometres since. <laughs> and I learned to drive manual so that I could drive anything, anywhere. And in some of the communities, once they knew I was learning to drive, I could say, get in the Land Rover now, or the tube carrier, and I'd be on all those roads. And, you know, it was a very quirky experience of getting around. But it is Australia. Yes. Oh, sorry, I tried to. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Favourite destination. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Australia in general. Exactly. And yeah. by the sea, because I grew up by the sea and then lived in Broome for a year and, you know, and then up in Port Douglas for a long time and I'm going to figure out where might be the best place could be here. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely for the next year, we'll be yeah. spending a lot of time with you. Um, we are, I, you were all given a um, lucky door ticket as you came oh, in good. today, yes. Wow. So we are, Linda, you're going to draw that. So yeah. Linda has very generously donated um, one of her very, two of these with very rare silk scarves um, that is going to, a lucky winner is going to get today. I got to wear the one that 
that I don't get to keep. I get home and we give this one back. <laughs> but when we have the exhibition, we'll sell the scarves. Oh, it's going to be a merch, merch, merching it up then, Linda. It's B43. Oh. Oh. Before, but there's something going on this time, and I'm, I'm blaming my father. <laughs> that there's something connecting me here which I find pretty interesting. And I think this whole Bundaberg area community and locations around what's going on that's you know, there's something pretty amazing happening. And I do love being in remote regional communities when new things are beginning to happen. Thank you. And, uh, um, for agreeing to um, the talk today and being part of our um, gallery. I actually just want to finish up today also. I want to thank our models. I think they're all back in their chairs. Please stand up and take a bow. They all look very glamorous and um, it was wonderful to have them. I actually also just want to thank, uh, finish up today by thanking the gallery team here. In particular, I'd like to thank Helen, Tony and Tina. Um, I've actually been out this week with sickness and um, so they have single-handedly pulled all of this together in my absence. And um, I just want to thank them for the amazing work they do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who attended this afternoon. I hope you had a lovely afternoon. International Women's Day for 2023. Um, I hope this has been, I've found this to be a beautiful celebration of women and particularly women in the arts with Linda, so I hope you have as well. Please join us at the gallery again soon for one of our events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.